Welcome, everybody. It's great to see all of you. I am Louise Bowditch. I'm a trustee. I'm very fortunate to be a trustee here at the lab um, because this is one of the most exciting places in Maine. The scientists at Bigelow work in all of the oceans of the world. They go on research vessels to the, as you heard last week, Antarctica, the Southern Ocean, the Arctic. Beth Orchid is about to leave, I think, for the Mid-Atlantic. They bring their research back to the lab and they study the processes in the ocean that help us to understand how we can solve the changing challenges that this ocean is now presenting to us. We need to understand it if we're going to protect it, and that's what happens here at Bigelow. I also have to say that the research, research scientists here are terrific at finding grants to support their work, but it doesn't begin to cover the cost of the kind of science that they do today. We rely on philanthropy for a large part of our budget. This is a nonprofit institution, and many people in this room are supporters of the lab, and we couldn't do what we do here without you. So thank you all, and thank you especially tonight to H.M. Payson that sponsors the Cafe Sci series. I'm a trustee because I'm the daughter of a Mainer. I've spent a lot of my long years here in Maine. I love the ocean. I sail in it many days. I swim in it. I eat fish from it. I want to understand the changing processes of the ocean so that I can help with all of you and all of the rest of people in Maine who care about this ocean that we can protect it. I would, I would love it if more of you would sign up for the meetings to stay engaged with the lab, if more of you would become friends of Bigelow, and keep this amazing work going forward. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Record, a senior research scientist here at Bigelow, who will talk to you tonight about citizen science. Nick. Thanks. Okay, I think I actually don't need this. I'm just going to pass this off to you, Kevin. Can everybody hear me on this uh, futuristic device? All right, great. Thanks, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Nick. As Louise said, I am sort of the resident math geek at Bigelow. Uh, my background is in math and computer science, and um, that's actually in a lot of ways the glue that, that uh, joins a lot of the science from around the world and in different parts of the ecosystem uh, that happens here together. So I get to work with pretty much everybody in the lab. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about math today because uh, when I do, most people's eyes tend to glaze over, but then I can find the people that I want to find later, that I want to talk to later. Um, what I'm going to talk to uh, today about is something called civic science, which is a type of citizen science that I've become interested in recently. Um, the, the talk is divided into two parts. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to walk you through some of the science that I've been working on for a long time and how that sort of brought me into citizen science and into civic science. Then we'll take a little break and you can refill your drinks and uh, ask me some questions. That's sort of like an intermission. And um, then when we go into the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk more directly about civic science and some of the potential that I think it has to to advance science, to uh, to help our society as a whole, and to benefit uh, the planet that we live on, too. Okay, so to start out the first part, just to talk a bit about my science and how it led me into citizen science and civic science. Uh, I think it's important for scientists to think about the future, and, and the way I do it is very much the way science fiction writers and and uh, movie makers think about the future. It's sort of this creative process. What could the future hold for us? And these are just a few images from some uh, classic science fiction movies that show uh, imagined futures at the time. So you can see there's someone riding a jet pack. Uh, so there's uh, the Jetsons in a flying car. Pretty soon, I think, we'll have flying cars. There's a time machine from the classic H.G. Wells novel, The Time Machine. There's a teleporter from Star Trek. 
And then over here in the lower right with the shirtless man, you have a phone call, but with video. So you could actually talk to someone over video. Um, and what's cool about some of these science fiction visions is that many of them have come to pass. So we, ha we have Skype now and, and or FaceTime or whatever. Um, uh, Gchat. I don't think any of them are sponsoring us, so I'll just say them all. Um, that jetpack is actually a real photo of someone trying out a prototype jetpack. Um, we don't have teleporters yet. Uh, we may or may not have time machines. Some of you in the audience might know something that I don't. Uh, but I'm going to share, so the next slide, I'm going to share with you one of my sort of sci-fi uh, visions for the future that, that drives some of my science. It's a little bit frightening at first, so you might want to brace yourself. Um, so this, this image is, it's my vision of ecosystem forecasting. So hopefully it will have a forecaster who's a little bit more photogenic than the gentleman up here. But the idea is just like a weather forecast. Uh, about the rain and the snowstorms and hurricanes, you would have somebody forecasting aspects of the ecosystem to you. Um, in this image, it's, it's whales, and I'll, I'll touch on that more later, but it could be many parts of the ecosystem. And by the end of the talk, um, I think you'll see uh, the, the potential to this. But my, my dream, my vision for this part of my science is that ecosystem forecasting is a part of people's everyday lives just the way weather forecasting is now. So just to walk you through uh, forecasting a little bit, it goes way back um, to when science sort of first started. This is uh, from a book by a student of Aristotle named Theophrastus, who wrote what's called the Book of Signs. And this is how people first started forecasting. This quote, it's a sign of rain when a tame duck gets under the eaves and flaps its wings. The book is just filled with forecasting techniques like that. They involve jellyfish. Uh, ox, oxen rolling in the dirt, uh, various things like that. It's a really, um, really amusing read. But, but for millennia, actually, that's how people were forecasting, based on signs, uh, cues of things that were going to happen. Really, you have to fast forward to the 20th century to get modern weather forecasting, where you have advanced computers, you have the laws of physics are written into equ equations that we can solve, and you have measurement uh, devices all around the planet taking meteorological me measurements that feed the models that make the forecasts. And today, um, we have forecasts that are uh, integrated into our lives in a really fundamental way. This is a picture of the actual track of Hurricane Sandy in 2012 and the forecasted track uh, three days ahead of time. So we knew three days ahead of time that it was going to go up the coast, take a 90 degree turn, and crash into land in New Jersey. And because we were able to make that forecast, probably thousands of lives were saved, maybe even more. So forecasting, whether you like it or not, um, whether you complain about the forecasts a lot or not, which I do, uh, is a part of our, is really integrated. Uh, it's something that we rely on. It's really integrated into our everyday lives and our society. So, uh, so why ecosystem forecasting? Why do I think that should be uh, involved in the same way in our everyday lives? Well, I'm going to walk through some of examples of ecosystem forecasts that I'm working on or have worked on in the past, and there are many more that I could list off. One of them that's of great interest at Bigelow is uh, what's called colloquially red tides, but more generally toxic phytoplankton blooms or harmful algal blooms. There are all kinds of species of plankton in the ocean, and when they bloom or multiply really quickly, they have these toxic effects. And they can be toxic to marine life, like shellfish, um, or they can be toxic to people, either who eat those shellfish, or in some cases, even people who are just visiting the, the beach and inhale the air that's coming off the toxic blooms. And so forecasting these blooms, uh, we are working on, on developing forecasting systems just the same way you forecast weather. You could look out over the next two or three days or weeks and see the likelihood in any location of a toxic bloom happening. And you could imagine how valuable this would be to um, uh, people managing for tourism and recreation, people managing for shellfish or people who are aquaculturists uh, growing their own shellfish or other things, um, and even fisheries. Another example that I've, I've done some work on is, is wild fisheries. So this is just a headline from... Um, it's one example of many, many headlines that talk about some of the struggles we've had in the Gulf of Maine with managing different species of, especially groundfish, but all kinds of different fish, fisheries looking back through history. And there have been some great successes in fisheries management and also some, some failures. 
But all of those successes rely on reliable ecosystem forecasts. You need to know what's going to happen next year if I do this to the fish stock right now. And um, it, that's very similar in a lot of ways to weather forecasting. There are equations, there are measurements that are made, there are inputs, um, there are advanced computers that deal with those problems. Another one that I've done a lot of work on over the last 10 years or so are um, managing the endangered northern right whale. So if you've been following news out of Canada, there have been, this says seven, actually nine as of yesterday, right whale mortalities in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. And that's a problem because there are only about four to 500 individuals left in the world. So when you lose nine in one summer, that's, that's a big deal. Um, the reasons for their mortality are mainly ship strikes from, from large vessels and entanglements in fishing gear. And for a long, long time, they've just been in the Gulf of Maine, and we've done a pretty good job uh, managing for those, those sources of mortality. And now they're, the right whales are moving, probably following their food, and coming into areas where the management hasn't been in place. Where forecasting fits in is the... If you essentially, if you can forecast where and when you're going to find right whales, you can use targeted management strategies. Like um, instead of shutting down a whole fishery, you can just shut shut it down where those whales are going to be and when. And uh, shipping lanes have been moved as well. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this example later. Um, and just as another example of something I'm working on, a few years ago we started getting these big jellyfish outbreaks in the Gulf of Maine uh, since around 2014, and um, Jellyfish, I think, are actually beautiful, amazing animals, but they, they can cause problems, too. Everything from recreation, um, people complain about them when they're swimming, to uh, they can affect fisheries. There are big problems, uh, not in the Gulf of Maine at this point, but in other parts of the world. Uh, they can shut down fisheries. They can also shut down the intakes for cooling systems in nuclear power. So they've shut down nuclear power plants around the world, as well as uh, the... the um, aircraft carrier, the USS Ronald Reagan, was shut down by uh, a large swarm of jellyfish being sucked into the, the cooling. So being able to forecast jellyfish outbreaks would be really valuable. And the list goes on and on. We can definitely talk more about more examples. You could probably think of some examples yourself. Um, and the list of systems that I work on is longer than that as well. Um, but here, just to take a few minutes to talk about um, how we forecast ecosystems. In some ways it's like weather forecasting, but in other ways there are new challenges, and that's what sort of leads into citizen science and civic science. So I'm going to give two examples. One of them is kind of the traditional method for forecasting, and the other is um, the sort of newer method that, that involves citizens. So the first example is those right whales. This is a picture I took of a right whale in 2008 in Cape Cod Bay, where they tend to go pretty much every winter to feed. You can actually see the propeller uh, scar from a ship strike on this whale. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And pe people track pretty much every individual whale and the injuries they get. And so when there are mortalities, they know the whole sort of history of the whale. Um, about 10 years ago, we were working on this forecasting program as a way to reduce uh, ship strikes and gear entanglements. So basically the way it works, right whales spend part of the, part of the year in Florida and Georgia to have their calves, uh, and then they, th that's uh, typically during the winter, and then they come up in sort of midwinter and spend the spring and summer up in the Gulf of Maine where there's lots and lots of food. We live in one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. The whales have figured, it out, figured that out, so they come up here to, uh, to pack on fats to survive the winter and to reproduce. So the, the nice thing about that is if we can forecast where their food is going to be, we can forecast where they are going to be. And that's exactly what we are able to do. So here's a map of Cape Cod Bay and Massachusetts Bay. This just gives you a flavor for some of the inputs that go into the model. Um, and up the left, there are currents. Um, it's sort of cropped off at the top there. But those are arrows showing currents. There are tides bringing um, water and plankton in and out of Cape Cod Bay all the time. There's chlorophyll and temperature, which you can see in those colored images. These are these are variables that are measured from satellites that are orbiting the Earth all the time, taking, uh, giving us daily data. Um, and then there's a bunch of math. So we figured out the equations about how quickly plankton grows, how quickly it reproduces, uh, how quickly it dies, based on these types of inputs. And we can put all of that into a mathematical model, just like weather forecasters do, and produce daily forecasts of whale food. 
and we can use those those maps of whale food uh, to, to predict where the whales are going to be. And what you get is a really nice forecast with, like I said, a more photogenic forecaster. And we would produce these forecasts every week. So this is just four snapshots. The, um, the colored areas show where we had forecast white whales to be. And then they would fly surveys uh, over Massachusetts Bay to check if we were right or wrong. And the forecasts worked remarkably well. You can see those dots. Um, you can sort of see the, the reddish dots on the map show where, they, where it turned out that they found whales. Um, so when you have, the sort of moral of the story is when you have lots and lots of data, millions of dollars to invest in a single species, which is the situation for right whales, you can develop the, these really accurate and, and pretty precise forecasts for animals uh, that you care about or aspects of the ecosystem that you care about. And so you can have someone saying 90% chance of right whales. And so we ran this, this program for a while. Um, that project ended a few years ago, and the right whale population, for those who are interested, had been in a good recovery trajectory. It's just over this past year or so where they've sort of moved into Canadian waters, and we're looking for, for um, some NOAA funding now to start that project up again. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to start doing this forecasting again and um, hopefully be able to uh, get the mortality problem under control a little bit better. The other example, so the other example I'm going to talk about is jellyfish, because um, so you could probably tell from my implication that there are lots and lots of species we care about that we don't have millions and millions of dollars to invest in. And jellyfish are a great example of that. Right now there are other scientific priorities, and they're good ones, and there's only so much money to go around. Uh, jellyfish is just not a priority. But at the same time, people up and down the coast of Maine have been sending in emails and, and calling in to, to Bigelow and other places since around 2014, uh, maybe even a bit in 2013, and saying, what's the deal with all of these jellyfish? Uh, do you guys know what's going on? Is anybody collecting data? And nobody was, because there's no funded jellyfish uh, survey. So what I started doing in 2015 was aggregating all of those citizen reports of jellyfish. And I wrote a couple of articles, like in the Working Waterfront and different places like that, I, um, a couple of sort of news outlets to, to tune people into this, and they started sending me in, in reports. And what, we, what I got that first summer was about 500 reports. You can see on the coast of Maine, where they, this is just an animation of that first summer. The other, other maps are close-ups. Uh, this one you can see uh, Penobscot Bay and Mount Desert Island area, and the other one is more like Cobscook Bay area. And all the dots are these, these sightings that people have called in. Um, incidentally, the, me, the three main species people see are lion's mane jellyfish, which stings, and then moon jellyfish and white cross jellyfish are also pretty common uh, over the past few years. This program is still going, by the way. I put uh, this link down here, jellyfish.bigelow.org, which I'll remind you of again later. I'm still collecting citizen reports, so if you see jellyfish uh, along the coast of Maine, please go to the site and, and enter the data, or you could email me directly. So we actually got enough data that summer to start producing a forecast, which was um, which was pretty amazing. It was surprising to me that there would be that much information. And this this graph, this these maps show how that forecast got better and better over the summer as more reports started flowing in. It starts in the upper left. The uh, the shaded in areas are where we were forecasting jellyfish, and you can see in the beginning in the upper left, it's a pretty crude forecast. Those two dots show a couple of sightings that correspond with the day that this forecast was made. We're actually doing it on a weekly weekly scale, so the week this forecast was made. And you can see as you go A, B, C, D, that the shaded areas correspond more and more tightly with the areas where the sightings are. And after about a month, we were able to get this, this sort of level of forecast where we were doing a pretty good job. Still running the forecast this summer. Um, for those who are curious, this is just today's forecast for um, lion's mane jellyfish. You can't, you can't quite see the colors very well, unfortunately, but it's, um, there's sort of a streak that hugs the coast of Maine where there's a uh, moderate to high likelihood of seeing, oh, why don't I use this laser pointer? Right along the coast here, sort of, it sort of tapers, starts to taper out right here, but you can see a moderate to high um, likelihood of encountering lion's mane um, this this particular week, and it changes week to week, and it changes as I get more sightings. So this is this is uh, informed by sightings that I'm getting right up to today. 
so that's all really that's all really cool. You know, I found that even without millions and millions of dollars, uh, with enough input from people up and down the coast of Maine and the Gulf of Maine, a lot of a lot from Atlantic Canada as well, uh, I could produce a, a useful and, and pretty decent forecast of jellyfish of those three species I mentioned. But what was really exciting to me and started turning me on to these ideas of, of civic science was that I got a lot more information than, than I expected. So I'm going to read a few of these. These are from emails that people sent me. Um, out here on Vinyl Haven, where I have spent summers for 40 years, I don't remember ever seeing one before. We were on the water from 11 until 2, uh, with the tide high at about noon. During the entire trip, we were never more than 10 strokes away from groups of jellyfish. My wife says she has seen more of these than she has seen in 60 winters. I've lived on Spruce Creek for 10 and a half years and have never seen a jellyfish in the creek before. I have rode these waters for approximately 16 years. I row an average of three times per week from May throughout the summer and in, into fall. I have never seen so many. So there's a sense of uh, uh, ecological history. There's, there's more knowledge here than what I'm asking for. And, and I also get these delightful pictures of shirtless men holding uh, <laughs> blobs of jelly. Uh, there's some other interesting things that people sent me. <laughs> Um, so there's a sense of, uh, there's, a, there's a knowledge of people who live here of the ecological history of Maine. And, and there's even more texture beyond that. So here's, here are some more quotes. Children were picking them up and putting them in buckets and playing aquarium. Um, so really engaging with the environment around them. There was probably a neat uh, learning experience interacting with their environment. I've heard people say that when you see jellyfish, the mackerel are not far behind. So now we're starting to dig into uh, connections with other parts of the ecosystem. I'd never heard that before. So there's a testable hypothesis. I just wanted to give you my two cents on a reason why we are seeing these jellies. And that person went into uh, uh, extended hypothesis about why the jellyfish were suddenly blooming. That had to do with waves and wind and things like that. Oils, um, I can't remember exactly. I am especially interested in how this relates to aquaculture, which we also have in this bay. So now people are starting to think about how it connects to their livelihood and to industry. Um, and then finally, give, keep up the good work. It helps to know there are people who care. So people are making connections with scientists, which is really nice as well. So there's a, a lot more texture, actually, to these sorts of citizen science projects, which I wasn't as aware of. I've participated in them in the past. But dealing with this sort of torrent, hundreds and hundreds of, of emails, it really sort of woke me up to the potential power to um, this type of science. And that's what I'll talk more about in the second half of the talk. Um, I think this is a good chance for sort of our intermission. And you can take a little break and get some drinks. I'm going to leave a couple of questions, sort of prompting questions up here. Are you involved in a citizen science project, uh, which, I, which I might not know about and I'd be curious to hear about? And if not, what would you like to know about your local environment that maybe scientists aren't tuned into at the moment? This is a chance for me maybe to get some new ideas from you. But then also, if you have questions you want to ask me, we'll have a little bit of a break for some question and answer, and then I'll dive into the second half of the talk. So thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Profizer. I'm the director of communications here. Uh, so I'm going to be helping Nick out as uh, we do a little question and answer. So we'll have about 10 minutes right now, and then uh, Nick will give some more presentation, and then we'll have a little bit more time at the end. So uh, can I take any questions from the audience? Just a little information about jellyfish reports. I haven't seen any yet, but. <laughs> Do you want to report if it's just one jellyfish or where I've never seen them before? Yeah, what thanks are the for that question. So um, that, that link that I put up there, jellyfish.bigelow.org, um, it, has, it actually has a whole bunch of data that you can put in. The type that you see, um, if you don't know, you can say, I don't know. But it's got some images you can even click on. It looks like this. The number, the size. There's a box for comments, so if you want to add other relevant information, which, which you should do, because that's where I get these other insights that I was mentioning. Um, if you want to put in your name and email, that's optional. But I use those email addresses to send these forecasts back and to try to keep people engaged. Um, yeah, so. Past okay or just you can, yeah, no, past is OK. If you, know, if you remember when you saw it, um, and you know, even if you don't, you. You could still put in it. You could still describe in the in the comment box, and that would still be useful for me. Another question? Uh, 
Well, this is just uh, informational. Denver Scott River Association um, for years has been studying horseshoe crabs, uh, counting horseshoe crabs in the upper bay and uh, near the hospital. So if anybody's interested in doing something fascinating, um, get in touch with the Denver Scott River Association. And it's... Um, it's um, it's a two-hour wet job, <laughs> but it's fascinating. So that's an FYI. Yeah, thanks. And I and I should also mention um, there's also the Booth Bay Land Trust, and there are all these other depending on where you uh, live or where you're summering. There are all kinds of land trusts and other organizations. I have a list of organizations on my last slide of other places that you can um, get involved with citizen science. Um, Damascotta River Association is a great one, and Booth Bay Land Trust is a great one as well. Uh, my my six-year-old daughter has even done some sampling for the land trust in Booth Bay. Yeah, OK, so next question, wherever Stephen is. Do you know if uh, tick forecasts utilize um, civilian reports, or is it just medical reports um, primarily? The tick forecast? Yeah, so I haven't mentioned the tick forecast yet, which is another forecast I do, which I'll mention sort of at the end here. Um, I run a, tick, a deer tick forecast, and we're all starting to do dog ticks as well. But the deer ticks as a way to um, uh, sort of monitor for tick-borne diseases because there are Lyme disease, uh, which is growing in Maine, and there are others that we're worried about as well. This is a, it's a collaboration with um, Chuck Lebelsic at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. I think I have that right. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll touch on that again at the end. So we, they, for that one, we used, in answer to your question, we use a combination of past reports through the Maine Tick Reporting Program, which ran for about 20 years. And um, currently, I have a similar site, just like jellyfish.bigelow.org. There's tick.bigelow.org, which I will plug later in my talk, um, where, you, where anyone can just go and enter a, a tick encounter that you might have had. Oh. Have you ever thought of combining an eco-cast with a weather forecast, not on a daily basis, but perhaps weekly or monthly or something? for a phenomena that's local to the region? It seems um, like it would get a lot of attention, and also yeah. it might um, persuade more people in terms of climate change. I'm really making a jump here. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's a great suggestion. So, um, and you're thinking about in terms of the delivery of the forecast, right? So one of the things that... Right, yeah, so for people watching. So I'm still trying to figure out how to get these forecasts into the mainstream. They actually, many, most of them use weather forecasts as part of the input data. So you can't look ahead you know, to tomorrow's ticks without knowing what tomorrow's weather is going to be. So they are tightly tied with, uh, to weather. Um, so right now I'm in conversations with various media outlets about ways to get these sorts of reports out there. Um, either in the video format, like that scary guy with the tie and the lab coat that I showed you, um, or audio, like a radio. Um, I've actually started making these podcasts, which are sort of one-minute forecasts. They're also um, up on my website. If you go to eco.bigelow.org, that um, link it will be up on my last slide as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a link for podcasts, and you can see some of the uh, experimental audio forecasts that I've tried to do. I haven't actually brought very much weather information into it because I've been trying to keep them short. But I think the long-term vision, they would be very much joined with weather forecasting. Because you know, if you want, if you want to understand what's coming, weather is very much a part of it. So we could talk about the storm, but also how that's probably going to reduce tick activity or things like that, or jellyfish and so on. But it's a great idea, and it's part of this, this whole vision that I hope is our um, science fiction future. OK, we've got time for one or two more questions. There's one up here, Stephen, yep. in the, the uh, front. Thank you. Um, I am involved in another citizen science project. It's called the National Phenology Network, and it looks at plant blooming times. Um, I personally am working on pink lady slipper, but they have about 15 different, uh, 1,500 different kinds of plants that you can sign up to look at in your own area. Um, and one of the things they're trying to figure out is, are they blooming sooner and sooner because things are getting warmer and warmer earlier in the spring? It's the National Phenology Network. They also look at a seaweed called Ascophyllum. 
um, which sort of relates to what's going on here at uh, Big Oil Labs, I think. Yep. Yeah, and we're actually um, on a separate project. I have a phenology project as a separate one, and we're looking at marine species and hoping to um, link them with the National Phenology Network. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, it's, it's a, has been a really fast growing uh, program globally. And it's just amazing. It, what it illustrates to me is how many people are already observing and they're tuned into what's happening in their backyards. And the fact that they get something back out of it, they get to see kind of the global picture of what's going on, I think is a really valuable thing. So maybe one more question and then we'll dive back in. Any last? Thank you. Um, I have a question for you about um, the idea that you're really gathering data about the density of the observers of these particular critters you want to forecast. Is it some sort of crazy math thing that you do to say, how do we extract yeah. that into the density of the critters themselves as opposed to the observers? How do you account for that? And if it is some crazy math thing, just say it's some crazy math thing. But yeah. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. That's a major challenge. Um, I, and I'll touch on that briefly at the end of the talk. But it is basically, it's a math problem. And that's one of the things that's really um, keeps me interested in this problem as well as a mathematician, is figuring out ways to deal with the data. And if you look closely at most of my forecasts, they're forecasting um, a, something like a human tick encounter likelihood. So they're not actually forecasting the abundance of ticks or the concentration of jellyfish. They're forecasting the likelihood of an encounter between humans and wildlife, which is, which is um, I think, in a lot of ways what we're most interested in, but involves biases on both sides, both the human uh, behavior side and the animal distribution side, that you have to figure out how those work together. There's a whole branch of mathematics that's, uh, that deals with these sorts of problems, and it includes things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so those are some of the neat, uh, almost science fiction tools that I get to work with in dealing with the data. Um, so humans and, and robots. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's a great question. All right, so, um, but, and those were all great questions, actually. It's, a, it's really, um, it's really great to see that so many people are engaged in that long line of people that you might have seen talking with me. We're also talking about various citizen science programs. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Maine is uh, ahead of a lot of, of most states in that sense. I hear people from other states saying, how do you get people engaged? And in Maine, it's easy in a lot of ways because you just put the word out and people are engaged like that. So we're really lucky to live in a place like that. And I think there are, there are things that we can teach the rest of the country as we get more and more of these programs going and start using them to, uh, to solve real world uh, problems like things dealing with um, jellyfish, right whales, deer ticks, uh, what have you, and the many things that you guys have just mentioned. It's nicely into the second part of the talk, which is about civic science. So why civic science? It's a little bit different than citizen science. And I think probably a lot of the citizen science programs that you guys are engaged in have a civic science element to them. And I'll explain what that means. Uh, but first, a little bit of the motivation of why, I, why I've been thinking about this more and more lately. It starts with uh, the misinformation that we're dealing with about science right now. And um, this is not just recent. Uh, it, it has a, a pretty long and deep-rooted history, but it's really come to the fore recently. These are some examples of misinformation about science on social media. These are a few tweets I pulled. I stripped off the name of the tweeter uh, to preserve his uh, identity, uh, but you might be able to guess. <laughs> so just to read a few of these examples. It snowed over four months this past weekend in New York City. It is still October, so much for global warming. Um, in the 1920s, people were, were worried about global cooling. It never happened. Now it's global warming. Give me a break. Uh, it's 46 degrees, parentheses, really cold, and snowing in New York on Memorial Day. Tell the so-called scientists that we want global warming right now. And then finally, uh, global warming has been proven to be a canard. I love that, canard. 
uh, repeatedly over and over again, the left needs a dose of reality. Uh, these are just a few examples of many, many uh, forms of uh, misinformation about science that's out there on social media and, and other media as well. And it's something that re has really affected our science, not just recently, but for a long time. Uh, but more recently, we're sort of looking down the barrel with uh, a lot of proposed budget cuts to, especially to earth science, uh, coming out of uh, the White House budgets. And I know it's not the White House that makes the budget, but these things are, are, um, are really unsettling to those of us who are trying to study and understand earth systems and to those of us who are in other ways connected with earth systems, which is basically all of us. Um, and so this is, this is what has, you know, this is where I think citizen science and especially civic science can play a really important role. And so just to, just to touch on the difference between those two, citizen science has historically been, the model has been that a scientist comes up with a question that they want to answer, and they engage citizens to help answer that question, usually in the form of monitoring. And it's a really, it's a really brilliant way of getting people engaged and also of getting data in places that you might not have been able to get it, um, and even sometimes getting new insights. Civic science, in a way, turns that on its head. It's the citizens who often come up with the questions that they want answered. Uh, in, a, in a grassroots way. So it might be a question that's really important to them, maybe something that's happening in their environment or connected with their livelihood, or even climate change. You know, that's one that affects pretty much every citizen. So citizen science can emerge out of those causes as well. And so in this sort of uh, political world and science misinformation world that we're living more, more and more uh, in and dealing with more and more, I've been asking myself this question, with large cuts in funding, what earth science can we do or could we do? And of course, it's not guaranteed that there are going to be large cuts, but it's something that we're thinking about. And even if there aren't, there are going to be these big ups and downs, which are just a function of politics that exist regardless of uh, who our politicians are. And I think citizen science and especially civic science can play a big role uh, as it starts to grow and, and become more common and, and cover more things, uh, more parts of the earth, more parts of the ecosystem and other earth systems uh, that can really sort of elevate and fill in those gaps. So just to, just to walk through some examples, um, so what, I think about this a lot in terms of earth monitoring because that's sort of the baseline of how we know what's going on in our planet. This is an image of uh, sea ice uh, put together from satellite data. It's a snapshot from August 2016. When we started flying satellites over the Earth, it was like turning on a light in a dark room, where previously we had just been feeling around. Suddenly the light is on and we could see everything. And a lot of the talk coming out of these uh, federal funding conversations are to turn those satellites to other purposes. People talk about deep space exploration and so on. Uh, but that would be very much like turning that light off. And so we have to start asking, you know, where are those lighters going to be that help us continue to see what's going on? And there are all, already a lot of examples, as evidenced by some of the questions and comments in this crowd, of that happening. So this is a really neat one happening in the Arctic, where people who live up and around the sea ice, uh, mostly in Inuit communities in northern Canada, Greenland, the US, places like that, they, they work with and live on the ice all the time. They're observing it. They need to understand what it's doing as part of their daily lives. And they're making observations. And so there are these. Um, civic science programs arising over just trying to measure and understand sea ice. Recently, Google has funded one, so this is not a federally funded project, but uh, privately funded, called SIKU, that integrates this knowledge in a, a really nice citizen science digital platform where uh, people who are out on the ice can exchange information, upload, and get a bigger picture than what they're seeing in their local environment. And it, and it can be a really powerful tool. And because this idea uh, came from the needs of the community itself, uh, it has real staying power, um, as opposed to uh, scientists coming up with an idea in a lab, perhaps, and then asking for a bunch of measurements to be made. Now, I think this, poten this idea has a lot of potential to really extend in a, in a global way, not sea ice in particular, but this type of model. And the reason I think that is because there's so much information being networked now. This is an animation of the sun rising over the Americas. You can see nighttime receding. And the spots that are lighting up are just tweets, all tweets happening across the Americas. 
And so you could imagine if you were some kind of troglodyte living underground, you had no idea that you were on a rotating sphere, you could use this data to learn something about a geoscale process. You could probably figure out that you lived on a rotating sphere. Now that's a pretty simple, you know, almost trivial example. Um, we already know that, um, but there, but there's a lot of other information. This also just tweets. If you start to dig into that information and other social media and other things that people are observing, there's a lot more information about the world around them uh, that's embedded there. There are ways that we're using it already. Uh, the Waze app. So maybe some of you use this trying to find your way to the lab, uh, and hopefully it didn't wind up at the end of Ocean Point or something. It's just like GPS, except that it's taking in data from, other, from all the users of the app. So you can uh, input construction, or traffic jams, or even, or even cops. And all that information gets shared, and it becomes basically a living, dynamic map of the roads instead of a static one. And, um, and it's made helicopter traffic reports almost obsolete. So you don't need that eye in the sky anymore when you have a lot of people networked together in the right way. Another great example is Wonderground, which is a weather forecasting site. Um, they do use satellite data, but they've also got, I think, something like three or 500,000 weather stations networked around the world. And these are just people who have decided to install a weather station in their own home and connect to this network. So it's, uh, you know, it's a citizen organization providing data where now we're starting to do global Earth system monitoring. Um, some of the, some, there are lots of examples um, I could go through of sort of uh, citizens coming up with problems that need to be solved. There are more and more all the time. One of my favorites is after the, um, the, the uh, uh, nuclear plant in Fukushima disaster, uh, people who live in the area are concerned about radiation. And so this program, SafeCast, was put together. People are walking around the streets detecting levels of radiation in real time, and so you can get a map of the radiation level on your street, on your block, and so on. And so that's a real, uh, you know, a real human health concern, but now we have real-time, instantaneous, spatially mapped data. Uh, in case you're curious, the, um, when you get up to about 10, that's when it's really dangerous to uh, human health. I, I looked that up. Uh, and if you get up to 100, you're pretty much toast. So it's, it's pretty high in this area here. Um, and then just another example that, that's a bit more local. There's this program, Vital Signs, um, that I've worked with a bunch in the past. It's run out of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And um, they're looking for invasive species in Maine. And these are problems that a lot of people in Maine are dealing with, from milfoil to green crabs. And uh, this, this program is designed to engage 7th and 8th graders to um, go out into their environment. It's sort of a, um, there's a curricu curriculum built around it to go into the environment and start monitoring for invasive species across the state of Maine. It's not just aquatic species, but, but terrestrial species as well. And there's a growing database now, I think, with thousands or maybe tens of thousands of sightings. And uh, I'm trying to uh, figure out ways to bring those data into my forecasts uh, as well. So just to kind of wrap up, um, there, there are challenges and opportunities, which uh, some of you guys have picked up on already. Um, the challenges include working with low quality control data and working with irregular or sparse data. And I've already sort of uh, talked about this because of that very insightful question. But it basically comes down to developing new math and new co uh, computational algorithms to figure out how to work with that. And machine learning and artificial intelligence have been great tools. There are new statistics designed to work with, um, you might have heard the buzzword big data. Um, so there are all kinds of new statistical tools to deal with those as well. And that's a really interesting and always developing area of, of science. The opportunities, uh, the list is much longer. And here are just a few. Um, citizens become informed actors in science policy conversations. Now this is especially true for civic science where a lot of the questions and hypotheses are coming from the grassroots. It's something that, that people are already concerned about. Engaging them in the scientific process uh, makes them informed actors in any policy conversations that might happen because of that whatever issue they're looking at. A second point, it counters mistrust of science. So I mentioned the, uh, the tweets by you know, whoever's out there in, on Twitter saying these uh, really uninformed things. Uh, there are people like that spreading this sort of mistrust of science. When people become involved and engaged with science, it helps to counter that. And when people can understand the scientific process and be involved with it, um, I think it helps build trust in science. 
And then the last one I'll mention is sort of a, a hopeful, um, a hopeful statement. A science-friendly public should lead to a science-friendly government. And so that's something that, as I build, get more and more involved in citizen science and civic science, something that I'm hopeful for. And so just to bring it back around to my forecasting, um, the Eric, who had a question about the tick forecast, already mentioned this, but I'm starting to, to, to build out this forecasting system to include more and more species. We have a, a deer tick forecast now that is up and running and live, and you can go to tick.bigelow.org and input tick sightings as you see them. Um, there's still a lag right now between those sightings and getting uh, incorporated into the forecast, but ultimately we hope for that to be basically real time. Like you could put in a forecast and see how your data has changed, or sorry, put in a sighting and see how your data has changed the forecast. Uh, and maybe that will encourage people to look around in new places. Um, the, the jellyfish one is up as well. And we're trying to build the system to be general so that as people come to us with ideas, like I'm really interested in Japanese beetles or something like that, that we can build out more and more of these uh, forecasting programs and maybe even start to see connections between species. Um, yeah, and so uh, I'll stop there. I'm going to leave you with this, this list. So just down below, I've listed out some of the... Um, citizen science programs in Maine that I've worked with in the, in the past. There are lots more that people have already mentioned here, like the Damascotta River Association and the, the Phenology Network. Um, there are lots more iNaturalist. The list goes on and on. These are some of the local ones, but there are even lots, of, lots more than this. And if you're interested, de I definitely encourage you to, uh, to get involved. And with that, uh, thanks, everybody. And I'd love to take even more questions if you have some. Okay, questions for Nick? Just, you know, I think this is all wonderful, you know, way of getting data, you know, from when you're dealing with life, but, you know, it's kind of like focused on me, which is a good thing, but at some point you're going to try and do it on a, a global level. <laughs> and somehow you have more some sort of central you know, place where all the data can come together. Yeah. I mean, that's something that I think should be kind of like begun to be thought about so that you Plan the future for it. Yep. Uh, and then like that. Yeah, so um, I am starting to grow some of these forecasts outside of Maine. Maine has been a great place to start for many of the reasons that I said. Um, that it, just the amount of engagement that we already have of, of citizen scientists is pretty high here compared to other places. But the tick forecast goes from New York through Atlantic Canada. So we're starting to grow these. Um, and then in terms of storing the data, um, we have some great uh, computational and data facilities here that um, we have a supercomputer here. We have massive data storage. And um, I'm sure there are lots of people who would like to become the, the central hub for like global forecasting. A until there's another one, uh, I would love to see that be here. Um, the, you know, it might, it might be that down the road we partner with some of these other institutions that are um, ahead of us in certain ways. Uh, but, and that might that might decide where that central hub is. Uh, collaboration is great because there are lots of other institutions that have put lots of resources to other parts of the problem that I haven't put as much resources towards or that I might not even be interested in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that is very much something that we're thinking about. And every proposal I write to fund this sort of research has money in the budget for growing our data storage and computational infrastructure here. A lot of it is moving to the cloud now, which also costs money, but that makes it sort of, uh, in a way, uh, not tied to a location. Yeah. Yeah. Just accessible, you know, to have the data accessible in one place, but right. you don't have to go to You mean like one place on the web? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was, as this grows out and becomes global, it would be really nice to have one place to go where all of this data is housed and where people can get it. And then my answer was what I said. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thanks. Other, Other questions? questions? Um, I've heard about the, I've seen a bunch of green crabs like I saw in the invasive species. Um, how did those come over here and what are, how are they being invasive? 
Yeah, so the green crabs, um, you look like you just came off the water. <laughs> they, uh, were you at the Sea and Science camp by any chance? Yeah, my daughter's there as well. It's, that's a great program. Um, the, so the green crabs, I don't know the full history. I think they might have originally been brought over from Europe, but I'm not totally sure about that. But they are associated with warm water. So in the 1950s, we had a pulse about a, um, five to 10 years of anomalously warm water, not to the, quite to the levels that we have seen today. Uh, but it, but it, there was a big uptick in the 50s. And one of the changes in the ecosystem that people observed was green crabs. As the water cooled, that, uh, and they had a lot of the same effects that they're having now. As the water cooled, that population receded. So they do seem to be really tied with, with warm water. And then, of course, the last, um, the last five years have been off the charts warm in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, 2012 was, uh, was warmer than really anything we've seen in the historical record. And the rate of warming that we've had over the past 10 to 15 years is faster than anything we've seen really in the global ocean. So um, the changes that are happening in the Gulf of Maine are really important to be, to be paying attention to because these are the sorts of things that are going to start happening as other systems warm faster and faster. And so, for, you know, uh, organisms like the green crab and, and really, you know, it's a bit overwhelming at times, but all of these things that people are observing, we're trying to, to sort of catalog this and make odds of what's going to happen in the future. Other questions? Yeah. I'm running. Hang on. <laughs> so we live on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, and just curious about um, your or Bigelow's ability to collaborate with other um, investigators who are doing similar kinds of research, trying to protect estuaries and other bodies of water. And, and it feels to us like a lot of the investment that's been made in the Chesapeake in the past decade or so is making a small difference, mm -hmm. but at least it's making a difference in a positive way. And just wondering if through collaboration with other similar groups, you can hope for the same outcome. Yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot in that question. Um, first is the collaborators with, with other places. So as Luis mentioned, we're, uh, we do research globally, and that involves lots and lots of collaboration um, within the United States and internationally. We have, um, you know, we have international workshops here, and our scientists go to workshops all around the world. And that's one of the things that I love about science, especially ocean science, because you know, the ocean doesn't have borders. Uh, you know, green crabs don't care that they're going from, from Massachusetts to New Hampshire to Maine or whatever. Um, so yeah, we work with lots of other people in lots of other places, and and what we learn by bringing information back and forth uh, does help. In terms of so Chesapeake Bay in particular, I don't have any collaborators there. We do have one scientist here named uh, named Jose Fernandez Robledo who does work on oysters and other shellfish. And oysters, you probably know, um, there's a huge there was a huge oyster industry in Chesapeake Bay. There have been um, stock collapses due to parasites of the oysters, and he studies those parasites. And I know that he has a lot of, he actually came from Maryland um, up here when he first came up here uh, probably five to seven years ago now, but he still collaborates with uh, those people. And I know there are other people who collaborate in that region. Um, and then in terms of, it seemed like at the end of your question, you were getting at what can we learn about Chesapeake Bay to apply to the Gulf of Maine? Um, yeah. I, I would say, in, in general, when you when you look at other systems, there's always something that you learn that you can apply to your own system. A lot of the changes we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine are driven by uh, global processes, whereas the you know and and so currents are bringing things in from the greater Atlantic to a much to a much larger degree. The Chesapeake Bay is a bit more enclosed, and so you have a bit more control over it. Um, and so they're different in that way, but there are definitely things that we learn, like about the oyster parasites, for example, that we can apply to systems here. Um, ocean acidification is another one where we have collaborations up and down the coast, and um, that's very much like uh, focused on the nearshore organisms like shellfish and that sort of thing, um, and ways of, ways of mediating that locally, like with kelp and, that, and other technologies, but yeah. one back there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
exercise. Uh, what's the current state of uh, studying bees? And, uh, you know, the great uh, questions surrounding bees. Bees. Yeah. Okay, we're starting to get it way outside of my area now. Um, uh, but I do know that there's a citizen science program to study, to, to monitor bees in Maine. And I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. But if you, if you were to Google Maine citizen science bees, it would come up. Um, yeah, but bees are a little bit outside of my, my I, you probably know as much as I do. So in the Chesapeake, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is certainly a very active and uh, involves a lot of people in the community. But one of the things about the Chesapeake is that there are years where there are lots and lots of jellyfish, and then there are years where there are not so many jellyfish. And I, I think um, it was my impression that it had to do with how salinic uh, the water was, how much rain there had been that year. And, right. the, and the number of jellyfish was also then somehow related, I don't know scientifically or not, to the crab population. So oh, it's just really interesting that there are um, similar issues with the jellyfish and what does it mean in the Chesapeake and what does it mean here? Yeah, that's interesting. So you, you, it's probably mostly the sea nettles that you're thinking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so there is a really strong association with uh, salinity and temperature. And there, was actually, there actually was a jellyfish forecasting program in the Chesapeake maybe 10 years ago or so where they were producing daily forecasts, almost like my weather forecasting vision. It never really made it to the mainstream, but that happens to be a species of jellyfish that is really uh, predictable because their habitat niche is so well defined by those two parameters. Um, so yeah, there, I mean, it kind of gets to, one of the challenges is how predictable is a species. And the sea nettles in, in Chesapeake Bay are a great example of something that we could, that we could predict actually pretty easily with low investment. Um, I, I haven't heard about their connection to crabs, and I don't, so I don't know what that is, but, but you also find a lot of these jellyfish you find in um, more developed areas. Most jellyfish actually grow up off of the ground, almost like a plant. So they need something to, to attach onto. It's called the polyp phase. And they, they grow up and they sort of branch out. And from the ends of the branches, the, the, the baby jellyfish uh, bud off and swim away. And they look like miniature versions of the adult uh, jellyfish. So in areas where there's a lot of development and a lot of docks, and things like that, it provides a substrate for those polyps to grow on. So in places like Chesapeake Bay, Long Island Sound, um, New Jersey, which, where there's a lot of development, you tend to get a lot more uh, jellyfish outbreaks. So Maine, we're a little bit better in that sense, but we're, but we're still getting them. And aquaculture could be another potential source of substrate, so people are asking that question. Um, yeah, things like that. But, but we still don't know. That's the sort of thing where if we could get a study funded to really track down the source of the jellyfish, you know, that would be, that would be a way to answer a lot of these other questions. Um, the citizen science uh, is, and, and citizen monitoring is really useful for forecasting and now casting, and, and possibly actually could be used to answer some of these deeper questions. But it, it requires, um, I think, a focused effort on that particular, like what's the origin of this species? Where are their polyps? That sort of thing. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> and uh, I encourage you to, um, to, to, you can check out eco.bigalaw.org. I forgot to give a shout out to uh, Victoria, who's a summer intern, who's developed uh, a lot of the, the site there that I showed you. Um, it's, uh, it's not quite finished, but you can still check it out, and it's uh, a really pretty amazing tool. Um, and so go there, and if you see ticks and jellyfish, or if you have ideas of other things to forecast, please let me know. I want more input from you. Yes, both. Yep. Deer ticks and dog ticks. <laughs>